every year we select one book and we encourage students, faculty and staff to read it and join in some activities and discussions that center on themes from the book. This year, the one book has been American Like Me, Reflections on Life Between Cultures, written by the actress and political activist, America Ferrara. The book contains 31 short essays written by actors, politicians, athletes, artists, and authors. These 31 authors all grew up with one thing in common, a deep and personal connection to more than one culture. They're all both American and feel part of somewhere else. Each of them struggled to establish a sense of self and find belonging. And as we looked across four seas, we realized that we had many members of our own college community who also grew up and lived between cultures. So today we'd like to share a few of their stories. Welcome to American Like Four Seas. And I'd like to introduce Professor Lisa Heller Borgini, who will moderate today's panel. Lisa? Thank you so much, Cindy. What a lovely introduction and a nice synopsis of our topic for today. I'd like to give an opportunity for each panelist to introduce themselves briefly, and I'll call their name and then they can introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start off with you, Ife. All right. Uh, my name is Ife Luatogan, Ife for short. Um, I am a psychology professor at Four Cs. Thank you. Hamad. Hi, uh, I'm Hemant Chikramani, uh, originally from India. Uh, I teach microbiology and uh, cell biology at Four Cs. Great, thank you, Hemant. Next, I'd like to ask Sergio to introduce himself. Hello, everybody. My name is Sergio Marini. I'm originally from Italy, and uh, I teach psychology here at the college. Thank you, Sergio. Matt, you're next. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Vasquez, and I teach economics here at Four Cs. Thank you so much. Ralph. Hi, I'm uh, Ralph Negron, and I'm on the adjunct faculty in the history department where I teach uh, Asian history. Thank you, Ralph. And Bin. Hello, I'm Bin. I am a student at Four Cs, and I'm originally from Vietnam. Thank you so much, Ben. It's so nice to have a student voice on this panel. So uh, now I'd like to go around and give everyone an opportunity to share a little bit about their perspective on American Like Four Cs. Uh, you're gonna share a story of between three to five minutes to kind of let the uh, audience know your perspective on this topic. And uh, I will go in the same uh, order that we went for introductions. So we're gonna start with Ife. <laughs> All right, I, I was expecting to go a little bit later in the process, but I, I, I'm game. Um, just very quickly, I had a hard time kind of condensing everything I wanted to say in the three to five minutes. So I decided to go with more of a stream of thought process. And this is what came out. Um, and forgive me for reading. It's just, it's too long to just kind of, but I, I'm going to read it now. Uh, the year I turned 10, my father was in the last year of a three-year psych psychiatric residency at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we'd gotten, my mother, my two siblings and I had gotten two weeks visitor visas to see him in the US before his return to Nigeria. I remember being very excited about this because we got a lot of American television and film in Nigeria and I consumed and loved all things American culture. So I wasn't exactly disappointed when my mother told me that she'd had a vision from God. She was a woman of deep faith telling her to sell everything we owned, a pretty substantial amount of stuff, and not return to Nigeria after the two weeks were up. She didn't tell my dad any of this until we'd arrived and had literally nothing to go back to in Nigeria. And immediately and simultaneously throwing us all into illegal immigration status, as it was called back in those days, and now also very poor ones at that. But this is not a story about prophecies and visions or gods and destinies. No, this is a story about identity and what it means to be American. I now found, my, I now found myself at the intersection of cultures all of them were very clear ideas about how I was supposed to think about, about myself and how I was supposed to act. I often tell people that I did not become black until I moved to the US and that's because black is not really about skin color, it's about identity. Both the ones you create for yourself and the ones forced upon you from the outside. Being American really is no different and no one in my humble opinion understands this better than the immigrant. As a black boy from Nigeria in America, I was suddenly confronted by three cultural forces that insisted on shaping my American identity. 
There was my mother, and to a lesser degree, my father, who insisted that we were simply to partake of the spoils of this country, but what I was and was to remain was Nigerian. There were also, of course, the cultural forces of hip hop and black the black cultural experience growing up in Queens, New York, where we ended up, that pulled on me and insisted that to be American was to be black American, which was the same as being American, but also quite different from being American. And of course, there were also the bigger forces, the biggest force of all, and that is, of course, the culture of the majority, with the very clear ideas about what it means to be an American. And more times than not, in my experience at least, that force was the one that pushed for a simulation of everything that was once me and molded into something that was more American, whatever that means. Subtle was the now, sorry, uh, never formally, but only sort of on the edges, there was a subtle idea that there was a hierarchy in America and different kinds of Americans that I had to become familiar with. It was my American duty then, according to this higher force, to simply take my place in the hierarchy and be grateful that I was even allowed to be here and accept the question of that natural order. Each one of these forces requested a unique exploration about identity. And I just did, I just don't have the time to fully break it down here. I've, uh, but let's just say that one of the things you hear living the way that I did between the cracks of culture, as I used to refer to it, is that there really is no such thing as an American, only Americans. I know it sounds like the same thing, but it's not. America implies a prototype, a best exemplar of the category called American. While Americans, at least the way that I conceptualize it, allows for the plur plurality of cultures as American without insisting that there is one way to be it. In my 35 years in, in America, I have been, and I suspect that you have too, many different types of American. American is not a static concept. It evolves and keeps evolving. And what I am now, and so are you, by the way, is a product of that evolution. That's it. Thank you, Ife. Lots of food for thought. I, I kind of wish we could discuss between comments because it's so so wonderful, so such a rich reflection. Hamad, would you like to share your story next? Certainly. Uh, I grew up in India, uh, uh, in the city of Mumbai, Bombay, which is now uh, Mumbai. And uh, just as uh, to put this in context, uh, India is a country which is actually more like Europe. It has every state has its own culture, its own language, its own script, its own food specialties uh, and religions as well. So growing up in a city like Mumbai, it is, it's extremely cosmopolitan and it's more like growing up in New York City where you hear like a hundred languages every day. So that makes a big difference to the way you grew up because even as a kid, uh, I spoke six languages and that was nothing unusual for us. So, you know, we're different levels of, uh, you know, fluency, obviously. So uh, it also, Mumbai also happens to be the most westernized city. So you get to see things that you wouldn't otherwise, mainly because of British and Portuguese influence in there. So I got all my education uh, in India, uh, starting uh, all the way from school, uh, college, uh, as well as uh, graduate work. Uh, and uh, school and college, I got at a Jesuit run institution, which is kind of unusual, but it's an elite institution. And the research institute I got my PhD at is also uh, an elite institution. And, just by the way, uh, we actually have Ivy on the walls, unlike most of the Ivy League places here. So uh, that's just an aside there. But the good thing was it was a very, very good education. Uh, more like the British type rather than the American type, more rigid in a manner of speaking. And uh, my first visit abroad actually was to Spain and France. So during graduate school, I attended a conference and a workshop there and uh, went back to India from there. But at, you know, I've always been a rebel. And uh, when uh, I met my wife-to-be in graduate school, uh, we decided we weren't going to get married. But then my mother-in-law threw a fit. So that's how we got married. And by this time, my wife decided that she wanted to finish her PhD in the US 
And that is how I got dragged here. <laughs> so, so anyway, <laughs> so I came as a postdoc to Brandeis University. And after two years, I went to Woods Hole as a scientist. And uh, by which time my wife had done her postdoc and stuff and decided that she wanted to spend the rest of her life here. And that is why we settled. And that was the hard part because uh, it took us some time to realize what citizenship meant. And it was really hard to give up Indian citizenship. Unlike some other countries, India doesn't allow uh, dual citizenship. Mm. So we had to make a choice and it oh, was wow. hard, but we did it anyway. Wow. So, and here we are. So it's easy to get to the uh, use, it was easy for me particularly to get used to the American way of life for, for many reasons. For one, there was no language barrier, which made it very easy. Uh, and uh, in school, just across the street from the school was uh, what used to be called the USIS, which is the US Information Service. Uh, it was basically a library and information center where you could, you know, come read the New York Times, whatever else you wanted to do. And that made it a lot easier to acclimate yourself to the American way. And more unusually, uh, in the 1970s, this was the days of the hippies. So Mumbai was chock full of hippies. They had to be scraped off the sidewalks, so to speak. And uh, they got transported to the airport. So uh, it became an interesting exercise. And we also had exchange students in college, which made it uh, uh, a lot of fun. So all this made it pretty easy for us to uh, kind of adapt to Americans' uh, way of life. And when we arrived uh, in, on the snowiest day in December 1985, I was... Uh, it was easy because uh, one of my wife's relatives, his wife was an American. So she got us used to grocery shopping and doing <laughs> things here, which was, which was kind of fun. So, so brought here uh, by the hippies and then not frightened off by the snow. That's pretty impressive. That is mind. correct. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But one thing I've realized that, uh, you know, uh, getting used to stuff, uh, both at Brandeis and in Woods Hole, it was a huge number of scientists and foreigners there. So we never actually got to meet a great number of local Americans. And you remember in those days, the number of foreigners was relatively small. So uh, it gave rise to a lot of uh, fun things. Like when I, uh, one day I got called in, uh, in Woods Hole and said, you know, this, there's a college here. They'd like you to teach microbiology. They need somebody to teach microbiology. And if my first question was, there's a college on the Cape, I had no idea. <laughs> and then, so I said, okay, I'll go and help them. I've taught before, so it was fine. And then I go there and they say, well, it's a 200 level course and it's four credits. So panic phone call to my wife. What the heck is a 200 level course? And what's four credits? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, that got solved and I, you know. And you, here I you are. That's a fabulous story. Here Thank you. All right, so. moving on, we're going to now hear from Sergio. Hello, everybody. And uh, um, yeah, I I'm actually uh, have a couple of things in common to what Haman just said. It just happened that I moved to the United States in 1985 as well. And, uh, <laughs> you know, those are interesting times. I moved to New York City. And, uh, you know, I, I knew a little bit of English then, just a little bit. And then, you know, slowly I learned more and more. And uh, that is exactly what I was, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about today. A couple of uh, uh, short anecdotes about language. And uh, in, in particular, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, um, Italian and English have a number of similar words, uh, of course, coming from the same uh, Latin mm -hmm. roots. Um, and uh, uh, the problem is that some words are similar and have similar meaning, but then there are other words that are similar, but have very different meaning from each other, which can uh, create some, you know, problems uh, in, in some cases. Um, 
some of you know that uh, I'm, uh, you know, a, a very passionate uh, soccer fan. You know, I watch, so I used to play soccer. I watch soccer all the time. I'm very passionate about soccer. And uh, both of my daughters uh, played soccer in high school. And of course, I, I, I wouldn't miss the chance to go and, and watch the games uh, and, uh, you, know, sit, you know, stand on the, on the sidelines. And then I would get excited about the game and start screaming and, you know, usually words of encouragement. And, uh, and, and you know, due to the excitement, I, was, I would often switch back and forth between Italian and English. And um, I realized that every once in a while I would get some strange looks from uh, some of the other spectators <laughs> there. And then I realized why is because there's an Italian uh, word that we use often to indicate, let's go, come on, you know, something that on, on that, on, on that, uh, of that meaning. And the word is die, right? So I would stand on the sideline and scream, die, 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 <laughs> to some of the girls as they were playing. <laughs> and the other parents were looking at me in a strange way, you know, not surprisingly. But uh, well, and the <laughs> other great story. Uh, short story that I, I want to, uh, to talk about is uh, something that happened at, um, at my wedding. And uh, uh, I wasn't living on the Cape then, but my mother-in-law uh, is from Cape Cod. So my wife and I got married here on the Cape. And uh, some of my uh, family uh, members from Italy uh, traveled uh, over here for the wedding. And my uh, mother-in-law uh, hosted a, a, a number of different uh, events, you know, some breakfast or lunch and some get together. And, uh, you know, my family was very appreciative of, of that fact that she was, you know, putting all of those things together. And uh, as a gesture, uh, they went to get uh, some, a vase with some flowers and gave it to my mother-in-law. Now my mother-in-law was very appreciative of the fact that she received that, you know, vase and the flower. And, uh, but then she didn't know what to make of the card that came along with it uh, because the card read something like, in sympathy, the Marini family. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that sympathy in Italian has a more of a positive connotation it, it means something like friendship and uh, belongingness, togetherness, sort of a thing. And uh, of course, it has a very different meaning here in the United States. So that's how you know my mother-in-law ended up getting a sympathy card on the day of her daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Little did she know. She's like, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's great, well, Sergio. To complicate things a little bit more, my, my family at the time, uh, had in Italy had a, a funeral home, so <laughs> like wait a minute, is it is this like a recycle card? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> That's great, thank you, Sergio. All right, Matt, you're next. Hey everybody, um, so my story is is a little, um, I guess, different in that, um, you know, I'm a couple generations removed um, from you know, kind of my, my family origin. And that story gets weird and kind of complicated as well. So I was born here on Cape Cod, a couple miles actually from, from the school, you know, but, um, you know, it's kind of, when we talk about, you know, kind of culture and, and, you know, things like that. There's always the question of, oh, where are you from? Or, you know, how did you get your last name? That's, you know, it's not Smith or, you know, kind of Nickerson or other common names that are around here for, for kids in kindergarten and on Cape Cod. And um, so I'm the first of my dad's family to be born in the United States, which is, which is pretty cool. And, and, but then it gets into more complicated questions. People always ask, they're like, oh, well, how did your dad like growing up in Puerto Rico? And I was like, well, no, he, he was raised in London. And they're like, what, how, do, how does this happen? Right? Like, well, how did you end up on Cape Cod? And I said, well, my grandmother opened the door to a moose and um, in Maine and they're like, well, how, how does this happen? Right. So, but it, it allows, and, and what I, what I kind of like most about, about the, the questions is, is it allows me to talk about just some, my family is really interesting people, you know, like 
my grandfather growing up in Puerto Rico and immigrating to New York, um, you know, through one of the first kind of big Puerto Rican diasporas and, you know, joining the Air Force and, and becoming a career um, serviceman in the Air Force and, you know, kind of marrying my grandmother and, and raising children abroad on an Air Force base or actually all over the world, Morocco and, um, you know, different parts of, of the UK and different parts of the United States and, and, and then settling here um, as, a, as a result because of said moose. Um, you know, but my grandmother's Irish, so it gives me this kind of other connection. You know, I, the first place I ever traveled internationally was, was to Ireland, so it gives me kind of this connection, you know, to my family that lives there as well. And it's just, it's afforded me opportunities to really, you know, discuss kind of um, my family in, a, in an area where it's generations of people who have been here for a long time in kind of a, a very different um, kind of way, you know, to, to break down, um, you know, kind of assumptions or, or open up kind of lines of, of communication about, you know, different cultures, which I think is, is kind of the fun part of all of this is talking about those things that uh, we share as uniquely American experiences, but also get to run through these different lenses of, of culture, which is always makes for fun, you know, kind of fun interactions and, and, and such. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Ralph, you'll be next. Okay. Uh, I thought that, uh, can everybody hear me okay? I've had some sound problems. Okay, great. Uh, I thought that America Like Me by America Ferreira was really remarkable. It was very compelling. Uh, and I, I think it really captured the struggle that uh, between two cultures that I certainly have felt. And I was uh, really gratified to see uh, the comments of the, the people that, that uh, wrote the comments in that book because it, it described a lot of uh, what I've gone through. Uh, like America, when I, and I came from Puerto Rico, Matt, uh, I came from Puerto Rico as a five-year-old and like America, I just wanted to blend uh, and I felt the weight of my Puerto Rican culture keeping me from blending. And I often felt like the uh, ugly duckling, if you will. Uh, I was born on an army post in Puerto Rico in the San Juan area. My father had, uh, was a graduate at the University of Puerto Rico and was a lawyer. And he was also a uh, captain in the army reserve. And when World War II broke out, he was a, uh, activated. Uh, he was a company commander in the 65th Infantry Regiment. And I'm not sure that uh, people understand that the Armed Forces of the United States was very segregated at that time. Uh, all the Puerto Ricans were in the 65th Infantry. The uh, African-Americans were in the uh, 92nd Infantry Division. And the Japanese Americans were in the uh, 442nd Infantry Regiment. And the armed forces remained segregated until 1948 when uh, President Truman issued an executive order desegregating all the armed forces. Of course, when my dad went to Europe, uh, my mother moved in with her parents. And her parents uh, lived in, uh, they had a a large tobacco farm up in the mountains of Puerto Rico uh, in a small town called Comerillo. Uh, so I was raised on, I lived on that farm uh, for many years until my dad returned from World War II. And then he was assigned to the University of Puerto Rico as an Army ROTC instructor. Uh, when I was about five and just about ready for kindergarten, uh, he was reassigned to and got orders to go to Fort Benning, Georgia. So I, along with my family, went to Fort Benning, Georgia. I couldn't speak a word of English. And so the, uh, when my mother took me to, to get me into school, they said that uh, they wouldn't take me because I couldn't speak English. And now I think, well, here's my father is a... Uh, combat veteran. He's a captain in the army and 
They wouldn't, they wouldn't even let me into school because I couldn't speak English. But my mom uh, persevered and she went uh, into the neighboring uh, town of Columbus, Georgia and talked to the uh, Sisters of uh, Mercy at St. Joseph's Academy. And they were happy to take uh, this uh, vagabond Puerto Rican in who couldn't speak English. And I have very, uh, just great memories of these very loving nuns who took me under their wing and the kids in the class who would take my hand and take me out to the playground. And I find it really remarkable that with absolutely no English instruction, no tutors, just by the love of these nuns and the kids in this class by Christmas, at just three months, I was completely fluent in English. And I asked my parents, you know, I don't want to ever speak Spanish again. And I think they understood that the ugly duckling syndrome that I experienced and they complied with that, but they always made me assure them, we'll speak English at home, but you have to stay tied to your Puerto Rican roots. You have to be proud of, we want you to stand tall that you're a Puerto Rican and not be embarrassed by it. And I agreed to that and we spoke English at home. Uh, but, you know, like the author, and it's really amazing because I hated the first day of school. My name is Rafael, which is a great Spanish name. I love it now. But at the time, I thought it was too damn Hispanic. And uh, my mother called me Affy, which is a shortened and a loving form of Rafael that you would call a little kid. And uh, she, the kids took that to mean Ralphie, and that became Ralph, and which was okay with me because uh, that sounded very American, and I wanted to, I wanted to fit in as an American. But on the first day of school, the teacher would announce, go through the roster, and say, "Rafael Negron," and the kids would all turn around, look at me like I was a visitor from Mars, and. Uh, I also associated with a comment uh, that she, she to told about uh, when about uh, the author talked about the first love of her life in first grade. And I had one too in first grade. And it was a very cute little girl who uh, we became very friendly and I enjoyed being with her. And she, first time I met her, she saved a seat for me on the school bus. And then I would save it for her, uh, save a seat for her. And then one day there was an interloper there. There was somebody else sitting there and she gave me a kind of a smile and said, well, uh, oh well, and I knew it was over. And I remember thinking, I don't think that I'm American enough for this girl. And I lamented this fact to my mother and I'll never forget her response was, well, you're probably pretty fortunate. I told her that I would probably have to go to Puerto Rico if I'm ever going to find a wife. And uh, now this is in for first grade talk. And uh, she said, well, you're probably lucky that she's uh, that she left you because uh, how is she going to cook Puerto Rican food for you that you like so much, like arroz con pollo, which is chicken and rice, which is uh, something I still love. And, uh, but you know, Looking back, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, I never felt American enough, and I still don't feel American enough. And like so many of you, my fellow uh, panel members here have indicated, what the hell is American enough? How could I not be American enough? My dad was a career army officer. He was one of the first Puerto Ricans to receive a uh, regular commission in the United States Army. He was a World War II, Korea, Vietnam veteran. Uh, I spent 22 years in the Marine Corps and uh, rose to the rank of Colonel. Um, my sister was on the National Security, uh, was in the National Security Agency and retired as the Chief of Staff. And I have a son who's a West Point graduate uh, and spent many years in the army as an artillery officer. But yet I don't feel 
that I'm American enough. And it's something that I've, uh, the book, I was so pleased to read this book that uh, to find that many Americans don't feel American enough. And like some of you've uh, indicated, what the hell is American enough? I, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, today I stand very, very tall and I'm very grateful for my Puerto Rican uh, roots. And I, uh, I have, I'm the grandfather of nine. And uh, uh, Sergio, you were talking about you know, your, your teenage daughters going to college, et cetera. Well, I want you to know that my oldest grandson is 26, is married and is a graduate of Harvard. Uh, I hope he feels American enough, but uh, it's ironic. I, I love going to Puerto Rico and I love taking my nine grandchildren with me. I want them to, to know their Puerto Rican roots. And I, ironically, you know, these are the same roots that I was trying to hide from uh, growing up as a- uh, Oh yeah, you know, it goes full circle. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. And our last panelist that we'll be hearing from is Ben. Uh, can you hear me okay? Very well, much yeah. so. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I was raised and born in Vietnam, a small town of Vietnam. And I immigrated here when I was 19, just two and a half years ago. So I didn't have many experience like you guys, but still something I would like to share about my life. Uh, yeah, I came here um, thanks to my aunt sponsorship um it was the biggest change in my life so being live uh, in the different cultures like vietnamese and uh, american is very difficult for me it affects my life um when i first came here is the it happened when the covid pandemic happened so everything settled down. Uh, I couldn't have a lot of chance to travel or explore the American. Um, yeah, um, in the US, uh, it's a very different from Vietnam, uh, from um, custom, uh, life, lifestyle, or um, working style. So I have to adjust to um, adapt to the uh, to um, to uh, different cultures. And um, thanks to this. Uh, difficulty, um, I uh, have opportunity to open my mind to see um, the, the world, the big community in the US. It's not only about the Asian community or about the, the, uh, the different community. I saw a lot of different things in the US. And uh, when I first came here, I didn't think that I came here I just think about the American dream and um, I really like, like to come to the US and I have a lot of opportunity to um, educate it to be success in the US rather than in Vietnam. And um, when I was at home, I had to uh, live with the Vietnamese cultures but when I go to work or I go to school, I have to adapt in the uh, American culture. I have to learn new things. Um, it's been really difficult to overcome all of things happen right now for me in my life. But I'm glad that I'm here. I'm really 
Thank you. Yeah, that's fascinating. So just a couple of observations that I'd love to hear reflections on. The first one is, it strikes me that there's a lot of conversations about when you arrived, not only how old you were or what trajectory, you know, we mentioned 1985, the time of when, what was going on in the US, if you individually arrived, or even if you are the product of, you know, generations that arrived before you, it definitely seems to influence people's experience. Um, another theme I'm noticing here is this concept of identity is so personal and it's so different for people depending on their own attachments to place. Uh, you know, this concept of maintaining that Nigerian identity that was so important to your family, Ife, and also the, uh, the concept of maintaining that, that Puerto Rican, those Puerto Rican roots that were for some of the other panelists. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if you had, now that we've had the chance to share stories, if you had any further reflections on, you know, either connecting it back to the book as Rafael did so well, um, or if you want to look at how you connect to other panelists, um, looking at how that sense of identity has changed over time, uh, if it has at all for you. Yep, I can, you want me to address it from here? If, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, it was my identity as a Puerto Rican. It was tough as a five-year-old and growing up. I wanted to be like everybody else. I didn't want to be the ugly duckling. And that, uh, that was in a sense a godsend because it made me driven. Uh, I became, I thought, well, it's being very American to be a Boy Scout. So I became a Boy Scout, but I not only became a Boy Scout, in a few years, I became an Eagle Scout. And when I played baseball, I was going to show these kids how a Puerto Rican can play baseball. And, uh, and football was, you know, that was a very American sport. So I found that it made me more competitive because I wanted to prove myself, to prove that I was an American. And uh, I did it through primarily through sports. Okay. So does but anyone I never else? Played, never played uh, soccer, Sergio. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too bad, but you know, you'll probably be a great soccer player. No, <laughs> but I, I totally uh, understand what, where you're coming from and, and, and what you're saying in terms of like feeling like you're not good enough, you know, yes. uh, particularly touched by, by uh, what, you, what you said earlier. And, you know, because in a sense, I, I felt the same way. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about what to talk about today, uh, I originally had in mind this story about um, when I became a legal resident and, uh, you know, I got my green card and, uh, you know, the, 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 the weeks and days uh, before my interview, the terror that I had because I thought that um, they weren't going to give me possibly the green card because, you know, I, I wasn't good enough. You know, they, they couldn't give it to me, you know, but, you know, of course, you know, I, I wasn't uh, worthy. I wasn't at the level that, you know, I, I needed to be in order to, to, to become a, uh, a legal resident. And uh, it turned out that when I went to my interview, uh, the, um, the officer that interviewed me at the end of the interview said, you're probably one of the easiest uh, uh, candidates that I ever interviewed to get the green card. I mean, you like pass with you know flying color so but you know it's um fascinating so yeah. how so anyone else want to respond to this this concept of identity and and whether or not you know that sense of like maybe worthiness or that sense of belonging that comes from that um i mean i can speak to it so I think it's interesting what you said about how we all arrive at this idea of identity and we all have very different ways of defining it. So for example, I, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like whether we're talking about American identity, whatever that means versus Puerto Rican versus Italian, they absolutely form They, I think what I'm hearing is that most of you would argue that it's a part of, it's a core part of your personality. It's a core part of your identity. For me, it's not. <laughs> we moved around so much when I was young that the idea of 
nationalism is meaningless to me. It has, you know, like if you said to me, are you proud of your Nigerian heritage? I'm not, and I'm all, I am and I'm not, you know, are you proud of, to be an American? Sure, but I'm also not, you know what I mean? It's, it's important. It, I think about, I think about the national aspect of my identity as influential, but no longer core elements of my, my identity. Do you know what I mean? Like I never think of myself in terms of I am Nigerian or I am American the way that many people do. It's just something that's kind of in the back of the mind. And one more thing, if I may, Sergio, what you said, I had a similar experience as I mentioned before, when we came here, um, uh, we were basically, uh, back then you were illegal immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't get legal residency till I was 27. So from about 10 to 27, I was kind of in that gap in various states, but kind of in that gap. Right. I had a different impression though, because I grew up here. So walking into that office, my, my sense was, I've earned it, <laughs> you know, but there's always that idea of I, you know, earning it because I mean, all my education was here, everything. I felt American. The only difference was that I didn't have a piece of paper that said I was American. If you sent me back to Nigeria at that point, I would have no clue how to be a Nigerian. So I was American and I wouldn't say I was demanding that piece of paper, but it was like, it should be mine because I've done everything I'm supposed to do, you know, to be American. Right. I mean, if I, if I may, like just say something quickly. Uh, I, I think that you know you're absolutely correct, but I think that perhaps something that differentiates uh, some of us is actually you know going back to what they originally said and talked about language. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you speak perfect English, no one ever comes to you and asks you, "Oh, where are you from?" You know. For me, it happens all the time. Like mine. <laughs> you know, it, happens, you know, it happens all the time that people come and say, "Oh, you know, what, where, you know, where are you from?" And I'm like, uh, "I'm an American." And I was like, no, no, I mean, like, you know, your accent. And I was like, "Well, you know, I'm from Italy." So you know that when you have that constant reminder there, then you know. You, it, yeah, you, you that's a, let that's me true. Tell you the story. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, when I joined the the college. Uh, like they would always, you know, this was a time when there were very few foreign students on campus. So it was mostly just Cape Cod and maybe at most Plymouth. And so I was obviously very different from the students and uh, uh, they would keep asking me every semester, where are you from? So I said, uh, because, you know, because of a different accent. And so I said, Arkansas. And they believed it. And they, I got away with it for three okay. years. Wow. Until the day one student got up and said, no, you're not from Arkansas. And I was you know, trying to act up and said, how the heck do you know? She said, uh, I'm from Tennessee. I'm from Memphis. So I know exactly what an Arkansas accent sounds like. And I said, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love the distinction of how sometimes identity is 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 you know founded by ourselves, and sometimes our identity comes from how other people see us. Uh, Matt. Yeah, like it's funny. I never really like growing. I grew up in my grandfather's house, and he very much um, assimilated into being accepting American as as his identity. You know, he served his country. He was. Air Force. He was educated in American institutions. He worked um, for the the state of Massachusetts in um, their in the education department, doing job training programs and things like that. So that was kind of the the bar that he set. You know, he was very you know proud to have served his country and things like that. It wasn't until I started interacting with other people who would like see me out and about with my grandfather, who didn't look like me that the questions came and, and you start to question your own identity. Um, I never really felt very Puerto Rican until people started asking me about Puerto Rico. And I was like, oh, well, I guess this is, this is part of me, you know, too, you know, and, and I think it, it's funny how that happened kind of in, in reverse for me. Uh, ben, did you want to share any thoughts on, on this conversation about language? and identity? 
Yeah, it happened. Yeah, it happened to me a lot when uh I walk in, people asking me where are you from. I must say that I'm from Plymouth, not from the <laughs> Vietnam. But I'm from Plymouth. <laughs> a lot of That's people true. ask where that. I say I'm from Plymouth because the accent and the language, and um, yeah, they look in uh, at the skin to guess that where. Am I from? But the ident identity is um, we are ninety nine percent human, so we are the same. We not really care about the identity. Nice. Yes, that's a wonderful thought. Yeah. You know, one, one more thing. When I get asked that question, you know, where are you from? I don't know how to answer it. You know, because <laughs> we bounced around so much when I was younger. So when I was born, I was born in Nigeria, but it's, when I was about a month old, we moved to Scotland where I stayed till I was four. So I had like a Scottish brogue, you know, and then we moved back to Nigeria till I was 10, right? And then we moved back, we moved to the United States and lived in Baltimore first and then moved to New York where I stayed till I was 18, then went to Louisiana and then went to Texas. So usually what I'll do is I'll try to figure out why you're asking. If you're asking because of my name, I'm Nigerian. If you ask because you heard something in the way that I talk, then I'm from New I'm from Queens, New York, you know, and then it's just because, again, I don't have that as I don't really have that understanding of place the way that people do. So the answer to the question is, is variable. Well, if you look at science, you know, if the universe is eternally expanding, then and then it is an, an infinite, then we could all say we're just from the center of the universe. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's one response. Uh, anyone else would like to respond? And I'd like to open it up to the panelists who'd like to maybe ask each other questions at this point as well. So Matt, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of riff on what Ife was saying. Like that's that's how my dad was. You know, my dad's my dad's mother is my grandmother's Irish. His dad's my grandfather's Puerto Rican. He was born in London and lived in six different cities until he was 12 years old and settled here, you know. So he has no sense of that kind of um, like regional identity or, or place specific identity. So when, you know, for me, it was like, I never really picked that up either. It's like, well, I'm, I was born here on Cape Cod, like, you know, like Ben, I'm, I'm from Plymouth, you know, like, what are you talking about? Um, so that's, that's funny, like how we, getting back to your like nationalism point, it's, it, for some people, it's, it's hard for them to disconnect Right. their identity from the nation state in which you know they were born or which they you know kind of fuel their identity from i have often been not, mistaken as a hispanic or arab for years mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and my wife still gets mistaken for arab by the way huh yeah yeah People have the need to put an identity on someone. From Chechnya, apparently she looks Central Asian. She ask. looks Chechnya, no oh dear. Um, <laughs> Sergio. No, I was just going to mention something about names. Uh, you know, like uh, Ife, you know, changes original name, right, to and shorten it. And I, I was just curious when when you did it. And the, the, the reason why I like, you know, why I asked is because... Uh, up, up until recently, uh, I, I had like put my foot down that my name was Sergio. And, you know, especially during the pandemic, you know, order, you know, takeout, uh, I have gotten, you know, when I said, who's picking it up? Sergio, I've gotten my name misspelled in uh, dozens of different <laughs> ways. And, you know, no matter how many times I, uh, many times I tried to spell it out. And so just recently, I just gave up. And whenever I call and I, I leave my name, I just say Joe, you know, and I mean, yeah. I never <laughs> had issues. Like Joe is like, it's first, second, you know, they get it and it's correct. And, but it took me a while though. I mean, it took me like, you know, again, I've been here for 35, almost 35 years. And I never wanted to give up my actual name uh, as, but especially until just recently. But I'm curious to know uh, about Ife. Like, mm -hmm. when did you change your? When did you shorten your name? Well, technically, I, I never did. So Ife. Well, the the pronunciation, yes, because no one 
if you don't speak Yoruba, which is the Nigerian language, that's the tribe mm -hmm. that I'm from, uh, you won't be able to pronounce Ife because it's a tonal language, right? So everyone, I've always been called Ife since I was born, but when I got here, people couldn't say Ife, so it was Ife, but it's always been the shorter version. Mm -hmm. No one has ever called me the longer version. That's just on a birth certificate and legal wow. documents. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I was younger, one of the things I always wanted to do was like, I wanted to be like John. So here's the funny thing though, talking about identity. My, uh, my dad's name is Philip, that's his real name. <laughs> and many, so obviously uh, Hamant knows this, uh, Nigeria was a British colony also, right? And many uh, people from my father's generation, they were born before Nigerian independence. So many of them have very sort of Emmanuel, biblical names largely, Emmanuel and so on and so forth. But after the British left, as sort of this pushback against colonialism, many of them started naming their kids traditional names. But I remember going to my dad just after we moved here, just being mad at him. Like, your name is Philip. <coughs> my uncle's name is John. Why am I? You know? So that's another one of those things where, and it was it, Ralph who said this, when you're younger, you hate it. You just, because it makes you stand out every single time. The teacher, you know it's you when they just stop dead. They're reading down the roll and they just stop dead. And you just kind of raise your hand. Like, you don't have to say it, it's me, you know. <laughs> And you so hate that feeling so much. Exactly like America. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. That's my biggest first day of class fear is like going over the roll. I like get it three days early and just like start practicing. I'm like, I'm going to butcher somebody's <laughs> poor name. And I'm never going to forgive myself. Like lose all ethos with my class. <laughs> you should volunteer to be a reader at graduation then. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> I did it once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I'll do it again. <laughs> well, I appreciate everybody's time. This has been a fabulous discussion. I have learned so much about my colleagues that I never knew before and have enjoyed myself tremendously. And so I'm going to turn things back over to Cindy to wrap things up. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for sharing. You know, I think if we looked across our campus community, we could easily find a thousand students and faculty and, and staff members and you know enjoy listening to their stories but i really appreciate the time you know that you put into this um talking about your own personal experiences which is sometimes hard to do for people um you know i lived abroad for many many years and my three kids were all born abroad and they never felt american and the, the most dreaded question, as many of you have said, was, where are you from? They had no idea what, how to answer that. You know, one was born in Morocco, one in Belgium, and one in Poland. And they had no sense of being belonging there or here. So where are you from is, is the most difficult question altogether. So thank you so much for sharing today. And I think our campus community will enjoy watching this. Thank you all. <laughs>